don't know who the teacher is yet. I'm just putting the microphone on. Watch it. Stay good. All right. Ha, I'm the teacher today. Still can't run away. All right. You know what? Wow. This thing is super hot. Hey, Eric, would you mind just turning me down a little bit? Because this thing is like hanging on my belly button, and it sounds like I'm eating it. Nobody wants to hear me that much. How does Joel do this with only one stand? We'll see what I can do. Good morning. Joel um, is in quarantine because one of his kiddos is, is a little sick, so they're being safe. And so I'm going to give you a, a, a heads up that I'm teaching this class next week too. So there better be a good excuse if you're gone and you're not running away from this teacher. So now that you know in advance. Thank you, Eric. Um, we're going to continue um, in the catechism. Um, I'm going to go back just a little bit, not necessarily to cover, but just for myself. I'm um, just kind of set up what I want to talk about today. Before we do that, let's open with prayer. Lord God, I thank you so much for the opportunity to study your word. And Lord, it's kind of interesting to think uh, at the time of Martin Luther, when um, he was so diligently trying to make sure that scripture was shared. Um, Lord, scripture was being persecuted and uh, the truth was not being taught. And Lord, it's just exciting to see that out of that time, um, we could have a, a reformation like this. It affects our world today. And Lord, I pray that you will help us to have a desire to know your word so that if needed, we also can be part of a reformation. Lord, I pray that you will equip us, help our minds to be strong when we need them to, Lord, and we know that you promised to guide us and give us wisdom, and we trust you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So we've been going through the second article. And um, the second article is a summary of of really the core fundamentals of what we want out of a, a biblical believing church. Um, let's go ahead and read it real quick. That's uh, on page 60 by 156 and 157 if you're just looking at the numbers. Um, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty from whence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. Now I've got a couple questions I want to ask you as we, as we go through today's topic because I want to apply these questions to the points that we're discussing. What are the worldly benefits... And, let's just say it, more importantly, what are the heavenly benefits? And if you were just to apply the worldly benefits to you and the heavenly benefits to you, just looking at the second article, what would be, what would be something that you would say? Worldly benefits and heavenly benefits. And that, there's not necessarily um, a real wrong, wrong answer here, so you don't have to be, be afraid. What's a worldly benefit of having this second article to use as a guide or to stand on? What would you say? Okay. Okay. And uh, why is it important? Why, why is that history important? I mean, you're, we're talking about history. We follow history back. Yeah. And it gives us a, a real starting point based on... The Bible. There you go. Yep. That's, a, that's, a, that's important. And how, why is that a worldly benefit? It's 
Stop talking to me, Greg. <laughs> yeah, okay. Why, why is uh, the fact that this is based on the Bible, could, is it a worldly benefit? Could it be? Right. I, I mean, I, I think it's fair, as long as we kind of, and I, I'm not trying to um, be light on, on scripture at all, so when I say worldly or anything like that, you don't, don't feel like you have to be that way, but yeah, I mean, it's a worldly benefit to us to know that we're dealing in fact, right? I mean, it is, I think. It's a worldly, that's a worldly benefit. What are you willing to, you know, what are you willing to do because it's fact? What have our prophets and disciples done because it's fact? Okay? So, keep that in mind again. Worldly benefits and heavenly benefits. And um, the direction we're going today is we are talking about Christ's redemption. Um, and I want to do a little, just a quick, um, a quick compare and contrast here. Um, We've got at, at number 185 in your, in your little catechism. I hope my number's right. I don't have the goofy book, do I? Is that right? 185. We're looking for the five stages of the humiliation of Christ. That's 185. Amber and I, I have an old book from like when I was in confirmation, and sometimes our numbers are wrong. I just want to make sure I didn't grab the wrong one. So the five stages in the humiliation of Christ are his birth and poverty, his suffering under Pontius Pilate, his crucifixion, his death, and his burial. That's the humiliation. Now, I think a good thing um, <coughs> to point out here is as we study this little area here, it's directly in regards to Christ. But, you know, this is, this is much more than just um, a biography. On Jesus, you know this. Uh, this has far-reaching implications. Um, so we have the five stages of of humiliate. The what are the five stages of humiliation of Christ? We have those there, and then um, at one ninety-three, we have the five stages of the exaltation of Christ. Five stages in the exaltation of Christ are his descent into hell, his resurrection his ascension, his mediation at the right hand of God the Father, and his second coming. So if you were looking at 185 and 193, what, what, are, what are the contrasts there? Looking at worldly benefits and heavenly benefits also. One is natural. Okay. One is natural. Jesus did it by being all man. All man, all God, experience it naturally. You and I could potentially experience that, right? Okay? One is supernatural. You and I can't do that. <laughs> Not on our own. Okay, good. What else? What are some other contrasts? Yes. Yeah. Now, because he went through the humiliation, we have our heavenly reward of 193. Yeah. Okay. Would you say that, uh, do we deserve 185? Do we deserve 193? No. So you can see Christ didn't deserve 185. But he willfully did it purposefully to save us. You know, and that's where we get to see this wonderful picture of, of grace. So we look at 195. 
what benefits do you have because of the resurrection of Christ? That's our question for today. And if you take a look through it, there are four different sort of categories of Christ's resurrection. Okay, we know that Christ resurrected only once, but it does have some power behind it. You know, this is more than just a story. Wow, Jesus died on the cross and rose again. You know, there's, there is power in this that affects you, it affects the past, it affects the future. Worldly benefits of Christ's resurrection. I want to look real quick at um, Acts 28, verse 17. And I'm going to read a little bit here. Just This is right out of Scripture. This is some of the worldly benefits um, that Paul experienced. Now, I'm saying this with confidence and trusting, you know, as mature Christians that you understand this, that Paul believed that Jesus was the Son of God, believed that Jesus came to earth, suffered, died, and rose again. Okay, we know that. He believes it, and he is now, you know, at the time that this happened, he is writing the New Testament, most of it. What worldly benefits did Paul gain from Christ's resurrection. 2817. Three days later, he called together the leaders of the Jews. This is uh, 28 uh, verse 17 through 31. Three days later, he called together the leaders of the Jews. When they had assembled, Paul said to them, My brothers, although I have done nothing against our people or against the customs of our ancestors, I was arrested in Jerusalem and handed over to the Romans. They examined me and wanted to release me, because I was not guilty of any crime deserving death. But when the Jews objected, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar. Not that I had any charge to bring against my own people. For this reason I have asked to see you and talk with you. It is because of the hope of Israel that I am bound with this chain. They replied, We have not received any letters from Judea concerning you, and none of the brothers who have come from there has reported or said anything bad about you. But we want to hear what your views are, for we know that people everywhere are talking against this sect. And when it says this sect, uh, at this time, it's talking about the early Christian church, okay, the early Christians, because they are radical. They believe in a, in a resurrection. Radical people that do that. They, arrest, they arranged to meet Paul on a certain day and came in even larger numbers to the place where he was staying. From morning till evening, he explained and declared to them the kingdom of God and tried to convince them about Jesus from the law of Moses and from the prophets. Some were convinced by what he said, but others would not believe. They disagreed among themselves and began to leave after Paul had made this final statement. The Holy Spirit spoke the truth to your forefathers when he said through, the, through Isaiah the prophet, Go to this people and say, You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears. They have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. Therefore, I want you to know that God's salvation has been sent to the Gentiles, and they will listen. For two whole years... Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. Boldly and without hindrance, he preached the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ. Worldly benefits. Small example. What are the worldly benefits of Paul? <laughs> what? We know. I said benefits. Okay, so, all right, so then maybe I need to change my word. Okay, I, I could say worldly result of. Now, would Paul claim this to be a benefit? Yeah, okay, he would. So maybe I'm okay to keep it with benefit. Yeah, look at that. Paul, Paul believes in the resurrection, believes in Jesus. He's under arrest. Okay, benefit number one. 
Aren't we looking forward to that? Any other, what other benefits do you see? It gets the opportunity to study and teach. I mean, look, at he's, he's studying the Old Testament and just he, by studying the prophets and the law, ties it right in with the New Testament that's coming. Because the Old Testament clearly talks about the coming of the Savior. It gets, gets to study the scriptures. I think it's interesting that this class was actually came to him. Right. Since he was under arrest and all of that turned around. Okay. They came, he couldn't go out. So people came to hear. Yeah. Now, what was the attitude of those people that came to hear? Some believed, some didn't. Okay, so Paul is going to jail, preaching the truth, and not everyone believes. But some do. So you can look here and you can see, you know, if you study Paul, he is hunted. By the Jews as he was moving on his missionary mission. Hunted by the Jews. They would, I mean, not, I mean, hunted means they're following him. Sometimes they even um, looked ahead and went to the city before he got there and tried to get everybody fired up. Like, this guy's gonna come and he's gonna tear down your, your walls and tear down your idols and it's gonna, you know, so he had them all fired up before. You know, despite the truth of Christ's resurrection. The matter of fact is, is Christianity is going to be persecuted. It was here, it is today, it will be tomorrow. Um, a benefit of Paul, his obedience, his obedience to the call. Okay, he has, he has an ability to, to demonstrate an obedience to God. He has to demonstrate to demonstrate this faith that he has in what he knows from the past and what he's witnessed in real life and what he's teaching. And another benefit, which I think is very important for us to remember, is Christians are beloved. Okay? Despite the fact that it, Paul is persecuted and in jail, despite the fact that the Jews are trying to tear him down, he is beloved by God. He has a message to share. He has a faith to share. And he has an obedience to demonstrate. And uh, we have that today, too. What benefits do you have because of the resurrection of Christ? The resurrection assures me... Let's look at number one of 195. The resurrection assures me that Jesus is the Son of God. Okay, Romans 1.4 says, Through the Spirit of holiness was declared with power. Okay, Jesus, through the Spirit of holiness, was declared with power to be the Son of God by His resurrection from the dead. What would have happened if Jesus wasn't the Son of God? No hope. We'd have no hope. He would have been a lunatic or a liar. I mean, that's our options, right? He is what he says he is. He's a lunatic <laughs> or he's a liar. The fact that he died as being the son of God, yeah, it's, it's more than just being a, a godly man dying. You know, the son of God dying, that's, that's a, there's power, <laughs> power in the blood. <laughs> power in the blood. 
Yeah, a power that covers sins, past, present, future. That, that's uh, one thing that um, a normal man, his blood. All right, so let's look at the next one. The resurrection assures me that Jesus has fully paid for my sins. It assures me that he's fully paid for my sins. Romans 4.25, and um, I'm going to turn to that one real quick here. Oh, that's not, that's not where I'm going to go yet. I have a couple of verses I want to look at with that, though. He, Jesus, was delivered over to death for our sins and raised to life for our justification. What does it mean, justification? Okay? And again, the question I want to ask as we go through these topics, what is a, what's the worldly benefit of knowing that our sins are justified? What's the heavenly benefit of knowing that our sins are justified? And what does it mean to be justified? So many questions. What does it mean to be justified? Let's start there. Okay. What is justice? If I drove through a school zone driving 40 miles per hour, what justice should I expect to face? I could complain and ah, it was an accident. I was trying to get the last ice cream at Fred Meyer's. That's why I had to go there so fast. But that ticket came because I'm breaking rules of the, rules of the road. Yeah. I wasn't trying to get ice cream when I got that. I was just trying to go home. And I wasn't going 40 either. Man. All right. Greg, the sophomore, got a speeding ticket in a school zone. 30 miles an hour. I'm a rebel. I made a mistake here on my notes. I wrote my, my verse down, and I didn't write my chapter. No. Getting what you deserve, yeah. It is. That's justice. Getting what you deserve. You know, so in the eyes of sin, um, sin has to be punished. And so if we, if we were looking at, you know, we're sharing the gospel, one of the first things you need to do when you're sharing the gospel with, with, an, with an unbeliever is you need to establish that there's a sin problem. And we need, we need to establish that uh, there's a sin problem because a holy God has given us the Ten Commandments, and we've broken every one of them. And so, in all justice, when we start studying, the wages for breaking God's holy law is death. And the simple matter is, is it's like speeding in a school zone. You, I deserved my ticket because I was breaking the rules, even though it didn't make me happy. Well, as we go through life and we break God's law, whether it's intentional or accidental, there's not an excuse. And because we've broken it, justice has to be carried out. And the wages of sin is death. That's, that's the debt we have. That's the only way to pay it is death because of sin. So for that fault to be rectified, for justice to be carried out, has to die for it. And we deserve it. We deserve punishment for our sin. But our justification is because that's why Jesus had to die. Right? I'm looking back to my confirmation, and I don't know when we went through that, we understood what we should have gotten out of that. The crucifixion and the sin that we. I may have forgotten it, but the church pastor uh, tried to hammer it in there, but uh, somehow it might not have. 
Well, it's funny how at different stages of our life, it, it, makes, it makes more sense, too. I think sometimes we think, yeah, I'm a good person, you know, and you're in the, the mental state of just comparing yourself to other people. But, you know, this holy Christ, Son of God, is an example of perfection. That's who you compare yourself to. You know, well, we'd love to all compare ourselves to, to Hitler and Al Capone and the Tasmania Devil on Bugs Bunny Roadrunner show. Those are bad guys. You know, it's easy to compare ourselves to them. But that's not who we compare ourselves to. We compare ourselves to Christ and his perfection. Acts 13, um, verses 36 through 41. For when David had served God's purpose in his own generation, Acts 13, uh, verse 36. Sorry, I'm going too fast. When David had served God's purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep. He was buried, and with his fathers, and his body decayed. But the one whom God raised from the dead did not see decay. Therefore, my brothers, I want you to know that through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Through him, everyone who believes is justified from everything you could not be justified from by the law of Moses. Take care that what the prophets have said does not happen to you. Look, you scoffers, wonder and perish, for I am going to do something in your days that you would never believe, even if someone told you. So, what's the heavenly benefit of being justified through Christ? <laughs> Start with the easy one. We're sinless, right? Such an easy one, we don't even want to, we don't want to say it. Justified in God's eyes. Sin has been punished. The fine has been paid, okay? When the fine is paid, you're no longer guilty. Are there worldly benefits of that? Peace. What do you mean? Peace, yeah. I mean, what if, you, what, what if you were relying on your works? Stress. Stress. You know, yeah, there's peace because it's taken care of perfectly, right? Peace. The uncertainty of, of, of trying to do works, oh my goodness. right? Oh, no, I didn't mean to think that. Oh, did, did I do that with the right motivation? Oh, have I done enough? Ah. Any other, what other worldly benefits? Are there any more? Not feeling the burden, so so it's kind of the the freedom and the peace thing could kind of be in, kind of be in the same. You know, does it help you recognize the dirtiness of your sin? I mean, you have peace, but you also have a joy, right? A joy in your salvation, you know. Just a, a, rec a recognition of what Christ took that you deserve. You know, there's a, there's a joy in that. I mean, even in Paul's two years of rest and being persecuted, it didn't take away his joy, it didn't take away his peace. 
might have been tried. I'd really like to try to f- see if I can find my other verse here. I'm kind of embarrassed. I've done that before in my sermon, my sermons where I write something down and I don't put the chapter. If I can't find it, I'm just going to move on. Give me just a second. See if I can find it. Well, let's just let's move on then. Let's move on to point number three. I apologize. So, just real quick before we do, before we go on to number three, you know, it does give us an opportunity to recognize the difference of grace versus debt. Um, you know, our our works cannot, in any way, or any degree, offer us justification. You know, and I've had the the privilege to be preaching on, on Romans 4, 2, where it kind of talks about Abraham, and the Jews were trying to point out that, you know, Abraham was righteous, you know, because of his circumcision and, and that kind of thing, but when you really get down and you study it, you learn that, um, that Abraham was blessed for his faithfulness before he was circumcised, you know, so somehow in Abraham's mind, he had an understanding of the coming Messiah. He had an understanding of the Savior who was promised, knowing that it wasn't him, ultimately, that was going to be um, the one responsible for getting to that heavenly kingdom that was promised, that was going to, um, he, he knew that he wasn't going to be um, in charge of a multitude of people by himself. So somehow he knew that God had a plan of redemption through him that was going to empower him. And uh, it, in no way was it self-justification, because if it was instead of being able to trust in the justification of Christ, we'd uh, have some reason to boast. And scripture clearly says, no, you, nobody has a reason to boast. Um, We are justified through Christ because of his actions, through faith in Christ alone, not works. And that's why we truly can have a complete joy and peace. The resurrection gives me power to arise from spiritual death and to live a new life. Romans chapter 6, this is is the text um, right by our number 3. I'm going to read just a couple verses around it. Romans chapter 6, verses 4 through 7. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. If we have been united with him like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. Worldly benefits of knowing? That we've been resurrected from a spiritual death. Think about it. Worldly benefits. Here's, an, here's a, a worldly benefit. While you're thinking about it, you can follow along if you'd like. Um, Acts chapter 5, 17 through 42. Worldly benefit of knowing that you've been saved from spiritual death and you have the opportunity to live a new life. 
Then the high priest and all of his associates, who were members of the party of the Sadducees, were filled with jealousy. They arrested the apostles and put them in public jail. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. Go stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people the full message of this new life. At daybreak, they entered the temple court, as they had been told, and began to teach the people. When the high priest and his associates arrived, they called together the Sanhedrin, the full assembly of the elders of Israel, and sent to the jail for the apostles. But on arriving at the jail, the officers did not find them there. So they went back and reported, We found the jail securely locked, with the guards standing at the doors, but when we opened them, we found no one inside. On hearing this report, the captain of the temple guard and the chief priest were puzzled, wondering what would come of this. Then someone came and said, Look, the men you put in jail are standing in the temple courts teaching the people. At that, the captain went with his officers and brought the apostles. They did not use force because they feared the people would stone them. Having brought the apostles, they made them appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, he said. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Peter and the other apostles replied, We must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus from the dead, whom you had killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior, that he might give repentance and forgiveness of sins to Israel. We are witnesses of these things. And so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. When they heard this, they were furious and wanted to put them to death. But a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, who was honored by all the people, stood up in the Sanhedrin and ordered that the men be put outside for a little while. Then he addressed them. Men of Israel, consider carefully what you have intended to do to these men. Some time ago, Theodos appeared, claiming to be somebody, and about 400 men rallied to him. He was killed. All of his followers were dispersed, and it all came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean appeared in the days of the census and led a band of people in revolt. He too was killed, and all of his followers were scattered. Therefore, in the present case, I advise you, leave these men alone. Let them go. For if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourselves fighting against God. His speech persuaded them. They called the apostles in and had them flogged. Then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. Worldly benefits. Worldly benefits of being brought out of spiritual death. What's that? Suffering disgrace for the name. Suffering disgrace for the name. Okay, and we've seen this with Paul being in jail, being persecuted. Disgrace for preaching the name of Jesus. What has happened to the message that they're preaching? A worldly benefit. Are we still teaching it today? What's happened? What's a worldly benefit of... It's, you know, again, we've talked about this, and it kind of overlaps. You know, we've got Jesus, the Son of God, who died and was resurrected. And we're preaching his name. You know, the new covenant that he's established. And, I mean, the Pharisees and Sadducees said it themselves. Why did he tell them to leave him alone? I mean, there's a chance. You know, well, they're, I mean, is their leader dead? Yeah. Jesus died. You know, so if he's going to compare this sect 
to the other two examples that he gave, what's going to happen to the followers of Jesus? They're going to disappear, right? They'll just disappear because their leader's gone. Is that, is that what's happened to the teaching of Christianity? No. No. I mean, in my mind, that's a worldly benefit. We've got, a, we've got a, the power of the truth, and not one word will pass away. We're beloved by God. Okay, well, I've said that already. How did they get out of jail? Was it by their own power? No, the door was still locked. The soldiers were still there. I mean, not only do we have a powerful word that we're sharing, but we've got the Holy Spirit guiding us, helping us, empowering us. goes fast. Well, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. the opportunity to rise from spiritual death, which we deserve. We've been completely changed. And now we can be viewed as having no sin. Well, We'll pick up where we left off. <coughs> um, again, I'd like you to kind of think about some of the worldly benefits we have um, from the resurrection of Christ. Um, the confidence it gives us, the joy it gives us, the peace it gives us, the hunger it gives us, um, the compassion it gives us. Okay, um, these are attributes that directly go to our hearts, and um, those those attributes are strengthened and guided by the truth of Scripture and by the power of the Holy Spirit. It helps us to have compassion where we don't. It helps us to have joy when we shouldn't have any. It helps us to have peace when we shouldn't. It helps us not to be afraid when we have every right to be afraid. Um, it helps us understand the importance of giving the word to the people that don't have it. You know, understanding what it means to be resurrected and changed and the hope we have for our future, which we'll talk about more. And it's to think about the people that don't have that, that don't have the opportunity to be changed and are going to be tried. And are they going to be found just? Justice? No. They won't be just, and justice will be carried out. These are worldly benefits that should affect us every day, one way or the other. Um, affect the way we work, affect the way we play, give us a desire to share. Um, overall, you know, our, our attitude. Um, it's amazing, really, how Jesus is our example. It's so easy to say he's our, he's our example, but just the whole fabric of our life and our structure as a Christian is empowered and guided by him. And uh, having the confidence and just the sure truth, man, it is, it's super, super exciting. So think about that a little bit this week, and um, I'll kind of come back, and we'll just pick up right there, and, and we'll move on. So thank you for uh, participating with my questions. Sometimes uh, it's easier for me to ask questions than just tell you what I think, and your questions add more to 
what I'm able to give. So it's a pleasure to get to teach you guys. Thank you so much. You're excused. <laughs>